There's a story told of a man that had 50-yard line tickets for the Super Bowl. As he sits down, another man comes over to him and asks him, hey, sir, is there anybody sitting in the seat next to you? No, he said, the seat is actually empty. That's incredible, said the man. Who in their right mind would have a seat like this for the Super Bowl, the biggest sporting event in the, in the world, and not use it? The man said, well, the, the seat actually belongs to me. I was supposed to come here with my wife, but she passed away. This is the first Super Bowl we've not been together since we got married in 1967. The man says, I am so sorry to hear that. He said, that's terrible. But he said, couldn't you find someone else, a friend or a relative or even a neighbor to take the seat? The man shakes his head and says, no, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> you know, it's sad, but I think some of you guys would do that. <laughs> you better not. Amen. That's advice. That's what not to ever do, okay? There you got it. There's your joke of the week. Praise God. We're going to jump right into this today. So if you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 17. We're going to start at verse number one. We've been in a series called Vision 2040, which is the 20 year vision of this church and how I believe that God is going to use this church to impact and change our city for the glory of God. To lay this vision out, we've been using the, uh, the acronym of a five-letter word, FAITH, F-A-I-T-H. Every letter represents something different in the vision. And so we've made it up to the letter T, and so we're going to be discussing the letter T this morning. So here we go, Exodus chapter 17 and verse 1. At the Lord's command, the whole community of Israel left the wilderness of sin and moved from place to place. Eventually they, camp, they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. So once more the people complained against Moses. Give us water to drink, they demanded. Quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me and why are you testing the Lord? But tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children, and our livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? They're ready to kill me. The Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. I will stand before you on the rock of Mount Sinai, strike the rock, and water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told, and water gushed out as the elders looked on. Moses named the place Massa, which means test, and Meribeth, Meribah, which means arguing, because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord here with us or not? While the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the, warrior, the warriors of Amalek, uh, Amalekites, Amalek, I think is how you say it, attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out with you and fight this army for us. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill, holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had an advantage, but whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up, so Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands, so his hands held steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua's army over, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. Father, for the next few moments, I ask that you would give me the mind of Christ as I present this great truth from your word. It's an important truth, God, that I believe will propel us into the future. And so, God, I just want to thank you in advance, Lord. I just pray that you would speak to your people here today. And I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that no one would leave this place the same as when they came in. And we give you praise for it in advance, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to circle back to this text here in just a moment. But first, we're going to do just a quick recap of the, of the vision. The first, first of all, the letter F 
in the faith acronym stands, stands for Feed and Clothe the Hurting. We've already seen much of the letter F come to pass. We are now in a place where we are witnessing hundreds of people being fed every single week, three times a week, no questions asked. We have a place now that is feeding a hot meal to people on a regular basis, no questions asked. We have people that even go out into the streets every Sunday night and take a meal to people. We feed another couple hundred people more on Sunday nights. We are giving away millions of dollars of food every year by the grace of God, all donated. We also have a clothing resource uh, where we're giving away hundreds of pieces of clothing every week through our clothing closet. God has surely been good to us. Then the next week we talked about the letter A. The letter A stands for answer the cry of our city. This is another part of the vision that we have seen come to pass. We talked about the issue of alcoholism and how it's destroying the families of our community and much of it's generational. We talked about going after the children and youth of our city because if we can get these young people to surrender their life to God through the power of the Holy Spirit, they will break the curse in their life and they will change their family tree forever, just like has been done in my life. We talked about our bus ministry and how our buses are currently helping us accomplish that. Then last week was the letter I. The letter I stands for invest in the kingdom. And if you were not here last week, that was a very important message. I encourage you sometime this week, go back and listen to that message. We talked about finances, both personal finances and kingdom finances, and how it's important to get our personal finances in order so we are able to impact the kingdom of God to a greater degree. And to help you do this, we have paid for a subscription to Ramsey Plus and the instructions for to, to access that. It's all free. is for you at the Hub. It's, we'll just find one of these cards, scan the QR code, or go to our website, greenbayfirst.org uh, slash Ramsey, and you can, uh, it's, it's absolutely free. If you would buy this on your own, it'd be about $130, but we have invested in it for you. We've paid the first year for you, so it's at no cost to you, but you have to actually, we've given you the tool. You actually have to do the work and go through the material and all of the, all of the, uh, all of the videos there, teach you how to put a budget together, all of that stuff. Some of us have never been taught that, and so this is a great, great opportunity to learn that. We also talked about the launch of Kingdom Builders. For those of you who really want to get serious in helping us advance the kingdom and give above and beyond your tithe. And so we have the Kingdom Builders Faith Promise Cards out in the lobby as well at the Hub. If you did not get one of those, take one of those. I, I asked you to take those home and pray over them. Pray over them with your spouse. And then in, in two weeks, two weeks from today, we're going to bring them all back in and we're going to just celebrate what God has done. So now here we are. We're at the letter T. And this letter is very basic, but it's very important. Because this letter actually is the letter that puts the legs to the vision. The letter I we talked about last week puts fuel to the vision, but this one is like the legs to the vision. This really gets us moving. And this letter I have not seen come to pass yet. I am still praying for this one. Perhaps the answer to the, answer to the prayer for this one is in this room this morning, I don't know. If you remember when we talked about the letter A a few weeks back, I read Acts chapter 1 and verses 6 through 8. I'm going to quickly read those to you again. It says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. You might remember me saying that if Jesus were right here in Green Bay giving us this same command, the city of Green Bay would be like Jerusalem. That's where we currently are. That's where we start. The state of Wisconsin would be like Judea. The surrounding states, even America as the whole, would be like Samaria, and the outer ends of the earth would be the other countries, Africa, Mexico, China, Russia, so forth. And up to this point, we've spoken a lot about our Jerusalem, Green Bay, so to speak, our own backyard, but God does not want us to stop there. And the reason he doesn't want us to stop there is because all people are important to God. And this might come to a shock to you, but even the people in Chicago that like the Bears are important 
to God. Even the Viking fans, God loves them too. I know it's a tough concept to grasp, but he loves them. <laughs> but once we get our foundation strong, then it's time for us to expand. And in order for us to expand, we need to raise up strong, godly leaders. We have to raise people up for the work of the ministry because the work of the ministry is never a one-person show. It takes many people. Being in full-time ministry for years, I've often fallen to the, into the trap that most pastors fall into. Uh, I would say most, most, most pastors fall into this. Some probably don't, but it's the, it's the trap of thinking we have to do it all. The think there's a trap that says this all depends on me. I have to be at every meeting. I have to preach every, every sermon. I have to be at every function. I have to be the one that takes care of all of the need, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when I can't do those things, I actually feel guilty. Not because anybody puts that on me. It's something I put on myself, and it's something I have to work through personally. But I've seen many leaders struggle with this, even, even in the secular world, if you're a leader and you own a business or something like that, you're, you've probably struggled with this as well, because leaders naturally, or they should, care about the organization that they're leading so much that they just naturally want to be a part of everything. But I, if there's anything I've learned about leadership, it's this, and this is true of all leadership roles and this is the truth. We as individuals cannot do it all. And if we try to do it all, if we try to do everything, we, now listen to me, we will be the one that actually stalls the growth of the organization. So if I'm not willing to let go and I'm not willing to release, the organization growth will stall and it will be my fault. And we can blame it on anything we want. We can blame it, blame it on circumstances, we can, anything. But it, ultimately, it's the leader's fault. And I realize that as a leader, I need to continually change and adapt. Because if I refuse to, I will actually hurt, not help those that are closest to me. I will hurt this church, this two-service uh, going to two services was a tough one for me. It's a lot of extra work. It's a lot of extra time. And I fought that, but I'm like, I've got to make this change if we are going to continue to grow. Otherwise, I'm going to be the reason that our growth stalls. I know that even though I want to be involved in everything, it's not healthy and it's not even biblical for the leader to be involved in everything. But this is tough for me because I care deeply for the church and, and for you and for the people of this city, and so I carry guilt with certain things. If you look at the words of Paul, my job as the leader of this church is not to do everything. In fact, according to Paul, my job is actually quite the opposite. Look at this, and we talked about this recently when we, were in the, when we went through the book of Ephesians. This is Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, so some of you might remember this. He says, now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Verse 12, their responsibility, their role is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So according to the word of God, my role is not to do. My role is to equip. My role is to equip people. Equip people for what? The work of the ministry. And that's the way God designed for his church to work. But for most leaders, including myself, this is tough. Because we don't want to equip. We want to do. The, the, the fun part is the doing. It's in the ministry. It's, sometimes it's not fun to equip. It's the doing that is fun. But Paul said to effectively build up the church or our Jerusalem and to build up the body of Christ as a whole, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, we have to learn how to equip. If the church is going to continue to grow, we have to be intentional about raising up leaders. If we're not, we're going to hit a certain spot and we will never move past that spot. 
John Maxwell, some of you have heard that name, he's a leadership expert. He wrote a book many years ago called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. If you are a leader, I highly recommend that you read this book. He's a Christian author, great man. But in his book, the first law, there's 21 different laws that leaders need to live by. Some of them we're stronger at, we were weaker at, so forth and so on. But the very first law, he, he says, is called the law of the lid. Basically, what he says is every leader, every person has a lid. For example, on a scale of 1 to 10, if that person has the leadership ability of a 5, the organization as a whole will never go past the five because that is the lid of the leader. The only way for the organization to go past the level five is for the leadership to raise the lid or have others come around him that can, or her and help them raise the lid. These are called lid lifters. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't like to do this because a lot of people don't like to let go of stuff, and because of this, the organization continues to suffer. I just know that if my, I have my hands in everything, we will eventually hit a wall and we will never move past it. As a leader, when the guilt comes creeping in, I try to remind myself what Paul teaches in Ephesians it's not my job to do, it's my job to equip. Now, Moses in the Old Testament is a great example of a great leader. He was a leader that faced many challenges. He was a leader that made a lot of mistakes. He has a personal encounter with God on the backside of a mountain. And in Exodus chapter 17, which we read just a moment ago, we see one of the leadership challenges that he faced that was before him. Let's go and read the first two verses again. It says, At the Lord's command, the whole community of Israel left the wilderness of sin and moved from place to place. Eventually, they, came, they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. So once more, the people complained, about, complained against Moses, give us water to drink, they demanded. <clears throat> Excuse me. Quiet, Moses replied, why are you complaining against me, and why are you testing the Lord? So first question here, who instructed the people to move from place to place? Was it the leader? Was it Moses? No, it says at the beginning there, verse 1, at the Lord's command. So God, I want you to catch this. God sends them into a dry place. God does. Sends the people into a dry place where there is no water. I want you to understand sometimes that God will sometimes send you into a dry place in life where there is no water. But remember something. It's in the dry place where there is no water that you will see the greatest miracle. But what do the people do? They complain against their leader. Poor Moses is just doing what he, told, what he was told. <laughs> Verse 3 again. But tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children and our livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, man, what am I going to do with these people? They're ready to kill me. Again, who brought them up out of Egypt? God did. But the people aren't going to God with their complaint. They're attacking the leader. They're ready to kill him. Moses goes to God and basically yells, help. <laughs> and this is where God gives Moses some very great, solid advice when it comes to being a leader. Verse 5. The Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. So God instructs Moses to walk out in front of the people, have the elders to join him. This is a call for a level of separation. Moses at this time was walking with the people. And he was trying to do it all. He was right in the midst of the people. Because of this, he's working sun up to sundown, which we see in chapter 18. He was tired and he was worn out. He's not in a good position. And God comes to him and says, Moses, your position is wrong. Go out in front of the people. But notice he didn't tell him to go alone. He said, I want you to take the elders with you. He said, I want you to take some key people that you trust out in front with you. Why? 
Because as a leader, and if you are in, if you are in a leadership role, you will understand this very well. The further you step ahead, the lonelier life becomes. And here is where it gets tough as a leader. Because again, most leaders, we want to be involved in everything. Being involved gives people a sense of purpose. And so as a leader, we can lose a sense of purpose when we begin to make this transition. But it's a necessary transition for the organization to grow. So Moses moves out in front of the people, and the people witness a miracle as the water pours from the rock. However, while they are still there, a second problem arises. Verse 8 again. When the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow I'll stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. They stood on each side of Moses holding up his hands so his hands held steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in the battle. Here we see that the people of Israel are attacked. Moses stays out in front of the people. He goes and he stands on, on a hill and he holds his staff in his hands and his hands up. And as he does this, a strange thing happens. As long as Moses is holding the staff in the air, the Israelites begin to win the battle. But when he begins to get tired and weary and drop the staff, drop his hands, the Amalekites start to win. You see, God's role for Moses was not to actually be fighting the battle here. He's, his role for Moses was not to be doing the work of the ministry, so to speak. His role as a leader was different here. If Moses would not have listened to God and went ahead of the people like God told him to do, Moses would be down on the battlefield, he'd be drawing his sword, and the entire army would have been annihilated. But Moses is right where he's supposed to be. He's lifting up his hands on the hill. Moses finally becomes tired, and so he can no longer hold his hands up. He's worn out. He's weary. And when that happens, look at what happens. Two men walk up. They set him on a rock. They put him on a rock for him to sit down, and then they stand on each side of him, and they hold his hands high up in the air. Because of this, the Israelites win the battle. And I think about that. What if Aaron and Hur, the heroes of this story, would have said, look at that Moses up there on the hill. He brought us out here. We're being annihilated. He can't even hold his hands up. What's he doing anyway? What a weak leader. Just let's sit. Look at what a failure he is. If they would have said that, do you know what would have happened? They would have all lost. Aaron and her included. But we don't see that. We see Aaron and her take action. And they get behind their leader. And they lift his hands back to heaven. And together they won the victory. Moses could not have won that on his own. You see, Moses had a lid. He had a leadership limit. He could not get past it. So along come Aaron and her, and together they are able to lift the lid. And what is the result of the lid moving up? They win together. Moses needed people to lift his lid. Let me make a statement here. There are some great leaders sitting right here in this room. But regardless of how great of a leader you are, we all need an Aaron and a her to come alongside, come alongside us to help take our leadership to the next level. I pray personally for the Aaron and hers. I need Aaron and hers, but they are extremely rare. Because these are people that will actually build you up 
when they're not in your presence instead of tear you down. And a lot of people will tear you down. And he, the leader's making a decision. This is in the workplace. This is in the church. It's everywhere. We, a leader makes a decision we don't like, and instead of building them up and trying to support them, we talk around the water cooler. We talk about how bad of a job they're doing. We talk about how we would do things differently if we were the leader. And I say, God bless you. Take it. <laughs> Become the leader. But they're hard to find. The real Aaron and hers are hard to find. People that will fight for you when your hands are down and losing the battle. Because a lot of times when your hands are down and losing the battle, people want to run from you. These are rare, but we all need them. And with that in mind, what if you could become an Aaron or a her in your workplace? Think about it. Rather than complaining about your boss to others, what would happen if you walked beside your boss and lifted their hands back up, so to speak? Maybe they're tired. Maybe they're weary. Maybe they got stuff going on at home. Maybe they're facing an issue you don't know about, so they're a little, little cranky. Maybe they're making decisions you don't agree with 100%, but what if instead of complaining where we all lose, you go up behind them and lift their hands? What happens if you would start to support the leader that God has placed over you? We, just do that. Try it. And watch what happens. I don't think any one of us in this room likes to lose, but if we choose a path of division, that's what happens every time. Jesus said, a house divided against itself will not stand. We will lose every time. We all need Aaron and hers as the Aaron and hers are the lid lifters. They're the lid lifters. But we can also be an Aaron and a her to someone else. What if you became an Aaron or a her to your spouse or your children? Some of us talk very negatively to our spouse and to our children. What if instead, there's a hundred voices out there speaking negative to us. Let's be the people that see the positive and lift hands instead of beating people with rods. What if we come up beside them when they're weak, we lift their hands to heaven? You could be the lid lifter for someone else, and when you do that, everybody wins. If this church is going to win, we need these types of leaders. We need the errands. We need the hers. And this is where the letter T comes in. The letter T in the acronym of faith simply stands for train leaders. And I said this six years ago, but I can close my eyes and I can see this church be in a place where people from all over can come and be trained for full time ministry. A, p a place where people will not only receive hands-on ministry training, doing outreach, riding the buses, taking care of the poor, but at the same time receiving a college degree, a ministry college right here at this church, training our future leaders. Every year... My stomach turns, this was another one, because we are losing all of our great young people to other places and to other cities because there's not an opportunity like this here in Green Bay, and so they have to go elsewhere. And I am praying and I've been believing God that God would send a director to us that could run the entire thing. They would recruit the students and they would fully train those that are here. And believe it or not, this is something we could actually start today if we had a director to run it. And maybe that's you. Maybe this is something that God has placed on your heart to lead. I don't know. Again, I've been praying for this for six years now. But look at what we do. Young people could come and they could receive hands-on ministry training. They're not going to get anywhere else. How to focus on winning the lost. How to focus on building the kingdom of God. How to, do an, how to do an, effectively do an outreach that will impact a city. What if God would use this church to raise up an army of trained leaders to send out into the world? What if that could be us? 
A lot of major Christian universities now, they're looking for things that are called an extension site. And I had an opportunity to see this work firsthand in Phoenix. And here's how it works. The college classes, they're all taken online. They're taken at the extension site, which would be this church. The church, we don't give the college degree. The college gives the degree, but the church serves as the classroom, so to speak. So it's a partnership. And because of this, the cost of admission is far cheaper than taking actual classes on a, on a college campus, but you receive the same degree. So not only will the student earn a degree, they'll have the opportunity to train in ministry hands-on, and anybody that has ever been in ministry will tell you that it's the hands-on aspect of ministry is where you really learn. Book knowledge you can only take so far, but it's the actual experience that you can't learn from a textbook that is vital. As a matter of fact, that's a big joke among pastors when we face something and we, we, I got, I'm in these different groups and stuff and they'll say, they don't teach you that in a textbook because you can't learn it. So what if we had a place where people could come and they could get a degree and they could be trained for full-time ministry at the same time? I know people in this church, you've had a dream to get a degree and do ministry, but you've never had that opportunity. And this could be an opportunity for you to realize that dream could be an opportunity for you to realize the dream right here at this church. Not only that, but I see once our foundation is strong and the leaders are trained, we can begin to send people. We can begin to branch out into new locations. It'll be time to then move out into Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, so to speak. By having a ministry college right here on campus, we would be training great men and women to take leadership roles in new areas, replicating what we do in other communities and in other cities. Can you just imagine what that would look like? We could literally change and impact the entire state of Wisconsin for the glory of God. Amen. Becca, if you could go ahead and come. Oh, there you are right over there. In closing, if we go back and look at Moses, we see his leadership go to yet another level when he makes the tough decision to step out in front of the people. That's the importance of surrounding yourself with key lid lifting people you can trust with your life when you're out in front. But we really see his leadership capacity explode when another lid lifter enters the picture, which was a man by the name of Jethro, his father-in-law. Exodus chapter 18 and verse 13 says, the next day Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. They waited before him from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, what are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do all this alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? Moses replied, because the people come to me to get a ruling from God, when a dispute arises, they come to me, and I'm the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's dec decrees and give them his, his instructions. This is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now listen to me and let me give you a word of advice. And may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him. Teach, the, teach them God's decrees and give them his instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. But select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. They should always be available to solve people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. If you follow this advice, and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures, and all the people will go home in peace. You see, everybody wins. So we see Moses again falling back into the same trap of wanting to do it all. Us leaders are notorious for that. He wanted to. He wanted to help the people. That was his heart. He had a servant's heart. Jethro comes along and says, Moses, this is not good. I understand you want to help everybody, but what you're doing is not healthy. It's not sustainable. Moses, this is not God's plan for leadership. You are actually hurting people. Moses, you need to train people. 
Moses, you need to equip people for the work of the ministry. Moses listened to Jethro, and with the help of Jethro, his leadership capacity increases. And as you can see, when it increases, everybody wins. I want to encourage you to be a lid lifter for someone else. Be an Aaron. Be a her. Change someone else's life. And when you do that, not only they will win, but you will win as well. But if you don't, you'll both lose. Be a lid lifter. Could I could have you bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to ask yourself as your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, who can I be a lid lifter for? Who can I be an Aaron to? Who can I be a her to? Who can I be a Jethro to? Just ask God that question this morning. Ask God, place someone in my, give me a, a, a visual, give me a name of someone. Maybe you're already thinking of somebody. Maybe it's a boss, coworker, family member. We all need Aaron and hers in our life, but we can't control that. What we can control is being an Aaron or a her to someone else. So I just, I encourage you to ask God this morning. Take a moment. God, who can I be a lid lifter for? Spirit, I pray that you would move in this place right now. God, this is such a powerful concept that if we would get this down and we would begin to use our life to support others, to build them up, to encourage them. God, how much different not only this church would look, but the city would look. It could start right here. So, Father, I just pray that you speak to your people in this moment. In the name of Jesus. God, I also pray, Lord, as we close this service out, I've been praying for that director, Lord. Such a vital piece to this vision to train up these future leaders. To take your gospel to other places, to other cities. God, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. I want you to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed.